my hedge fund made 30 million in one trade and I came from one lot. The real error that needs to be let out if there, if it's going to happen is in the mag seven, you have to think like an institution and lately new lows have been drowning new highs. I like when there's a very negative story, but the price is going up. We've been in a bull market in crypto for a very long time. Follow through days between day four and day 10 are the most powerful. I'm ready for anything. If you make special occasions every 20 minutes, you have no rules. This is what happens near bottoms. People give up. Mm -hmm. People stop, stop subscribing to the newspaper. They stop keeping their watch lists. These are bottoming type action. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trailland Podcast brought to you by the Ultimate Trading Guide. You can pick up your free copy down below in the description. Uh, I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining us today is the illustrious Jim Ropel, one of one of my good friends. Uh, he's the founder of the Ropel Report, a very experienced fund manager, growth stock investor. Uh, so Jim, good as always to talk with you. Really looking forward to diving into current markets, top ideas, and uh, whatever whatever else you got to throw our way. So thank you so much for coming back on. Fired up to do it, man. Seems like I get along really well with you because you're a great interviewer and you ask great questions. Um, Let's hope tomorrow the Fed gives us a treat and not a trick, but uh, odds are pretty low we're going to get a, a trick. <laughs> That's for yeah. sure. We'll see. We'll see. So to start things off, you know, uh, looking at what's going on in the markets, we're obviously in a corrective phase here. We, we've moved off the lows from the previous decline in 2022. To, to start things off, I want to kind of pick your brain and, and your experience and ask you, you know, what is the current market environment kind of remind you of? Is there is there a market cycle or, or something going back in history that uh, that you've studied or experienced yourself that, you know, you know, rings true with a lot of what's going on right now? OK, so. I'm not predicting this by any stretch. As a matter of fact, I'm not predicting this, but it reminds me very, very much of the top in 2000 early 2001, where the market just became so thin. It was, back then it was focused around like 20, 30 names. Mm -hmm. And I was just intoxicated with the market. I mean, I did, you could have told me there's two stocks holding it up and I would have been like, yeah, um, cause it was such a phenomenal period. But now I'm, and now you know what happened after that, but I will tell you, Arusha was interviewing me in 2021. And he said, he asked me a question and I, and I said to them, I said, is there any period in time that this reminds you of? And nobody was in the IBD thing in Arizona or in Napa Valley. And I said, it reminds me very much of 2000 because it was getting thinner and thinner at that moment. Now we didn't have a, an epic burst of a bubble, but uh, it reminds me of that. And, you know, you got to remember, dude, I've been doing this since 1985. As a matter of fact, because I wanted to know about historical bear markets and what they're like. And I was kind of trying to factor, you know, how old am I and how many will I see? Mm -hmm. And so we didn't talk about this before, but I'll just run by, run this really quick by, I started in 1985. Two years later, we had the 87 crash, which was like 20, 22% in a day. Now that was followed by nothing until the Gulf War. Uh, well, actually, there was the 89 currency. I forgot the 89 currency crisis, which was like, you know, 30 plus percent down in about, you know, two, three months. Um, but then along came EMC and AOL and Charles Schwab and Corning Glass, all stocks, which were monster monsters. But then we had a 10 year period of prosperity. Mm -hmm. 2000 dot com crash came. Um, that was two and a half years long. And 78% down. I don't know if many people know that. So that was about 31 months, which coincidentally, if you go from the day the AD line topped in this bear market, which I believe we're still in, it's exactly 31 months. Um, the market topped a bit. The market went dead sideways and had a bear trap breakout and then it rolled over. But the AD line peaked nine months before that. Um, then we went about eight years to the uh, housing bust which we had another collapse in the S&P. In the dot-com bust, the NASDAQ blew up. But in the housing bust, the S&P blew up. So, you know, I can go on and on. I mean, you had the 2015-16 bear market, 
which was just a hair under 20%, not quite 20%, but it felt like it. And then we had the C-19 disaster, which was three months down or whatever. Um, and now we've got this one. And so basically every two to five years, in one stretch, we went 10 years, which was, you know, historic, epic, secular bull market, which we may still be in. But you have a disaster every th three to five years, bear market, and then a huge ramp. Well, I'm 50, I'll be 59 very soon. If I live another 40, say, say I've been investing for 38 years, call it 40. If you tack on another 40, it'll get me to 100 years old. I'm going to see eight more monster bull cycles and, and eight calamities. And I think one is going to start very, very soon because I don't believe this is going to be the longest bear market in history. Okay. Um, but if we have eight more major bull cycles, whether it's a secular bear or a cyclical, I'm sorry, a, sec, a secular bull or a secular bear, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I've made a lot of money in secular bears. There are big runs in there. Um, I've seen all this before, but I figure there'll be, you know, 50 TMLs, maybe 30 TMLs in every cycle. I'm going to see eight of them. Mm -hmm. What is that? 400 opportunities for me to level my life up again. You know, don't anybody out there do not get too rattled by this. Okay. This does look just like it did in the, it actually is thinner than it was at the top in 2000. But don't ever bet against America. Don't bet against the golden goose of capitalism. People are out there breaking their butt to split atoms and code software and mine Bitcoin and come up with new, you know, new coins, which are new blockchains, which are going to be better. Um, do not think that, you know, capitalism is over. I mean, as a matter of fact, it's accelerating to the good. I track patent office um, requests for patents. It's not going at a linear rate like this. It's it's ramping. Mm -hmm. And that only means, you know, more, more companies are going to have to go public. They're going to have big sales and earnings. They're going to form a perfect cup and handle. And they're going to break out and running. And they're going to be whole new industries. And remember this. We have not seen any great IPOs. We had three that all were miserable. Um, we are probably in the very depths of a bear market. We might get one more big flush down, but I think like the IWC, the Russell has definitively made a new low. That's not a question of, you know, that that's bear market for sure. Small uh, micro cap is too. They're sold out. Okay. We could see a big flush there, but it, I mean, the odds of it collapsing into a whole nother leg down, not impossible, but I think the odds are low. The real error that needs to be let out if there, if it's going to happen, is in the Mag Seven. Yeah, That's I can ask you about them. Yeah, yeah. So, so what do you think about the Mag Mag, Mag Seven and having so much performance be contributed to just you know a select few, few of these names? Well, I think this has been. You asked me, what does it make me feel like? I feel like this has been the most deceiving smokescreen of a market I've ever seen, where Russell and Microcap make these horrible new lows. Oops, got to get the power cord, man. I got the, the red battery up in the- All good, all good. Um, what do I think? It's really hard to judge because AI is clearly the innovation that the CEO of in, uh, Intuit said, it's more important than electricity, okay? Um, Satya Nadella said, it's bigger than the beginning of, of uh, the cloud. So who's the biggest beneficiary from that? Well, it's going to be people who don't need to have innovation to bolt it. They can bolt it right onto their current platforms. Offerings, yeah. And they have the billions to, to invest in this and they have been investing. So they're the immediate beneficiaries. The smaller middle uh, com uh, lead cap companies, it's going to take time for them to understand it, implement it. So I get it why they're working. I really, really do. And also, you have to look around the world. The world is full of despots, dictators, communists, socialists. Money knows that. That's why for, what do we have, like 25% of the world's GDP, but 50% of the world's market cap? Those numbers are slightly uh, stating a case, but the money's all coming here and they have to go somewhere. So they're going to those liquid names. I, I don't know. I'm a trend follower. 
And I, I in a lot in the Ropal report recently, a lot I've put, if the market turns up, I expect more of the same because it's a trend and the trend remains in the large caps. Meta looks good. Microsoft looks good. And I expect them to do well because of AI. Um, they're implementing. So what's going to happen? I don't know, but I'll tell you this. You talk to a CanSlim practitioner and they're not making money and they haven't made money for a long time. The IBD spotlight NASDAQ index, I think it's down like 17%, 16% for the year. So oddly, with all that kind of bear talk or uncertain talk, this is what happens near bottoms. People give up. Mm -hmm. People stop, stop subscribing to the newspaper. They stop keeping their watch lists. These are bottoming type action. So, you know, let me put it to you this way. Richard, would you wait one year for a chance to double through your whole net worth? For sure. Well, okay. If we go longer than, if we go another year of a bear market, it will be the longest bear in history. What are the odds? With all that innovation. Now I know the Fed's raising rates, but I'm going to bet with America every time. Now I'm not throwing money to work on that premise, but I'm really on high alert. I think people are doing the opposite of what they should be doing. They should be doubling down on what is the innovation that might turn this whole thing? What is holding up really well? Now, I'm not talking about soap companies and Hershey's and Hormel. Okay, those are, when the market turns up, those are all going to break badly. They're, those are safe havens. Just look at where the monster earnings growth continues to be and what has, a, and so when the things turn up, you don't want to be learning about them on the follow through day. Okay, you want to be ready to go. So there's a 20 minute answer. Sorry for sucking all the air out of the room. No, no, that's that's good. But and and I want to cover a little bit more uh, doom and gloom just just for a sec here before we get to the fun stuff. True market leaders finding them all that, um, and we're going to run through a bunch of charts as well, which I know. Um, but but taking a look at today's action, w what do you think is the driving factor between you know the driving fundamental factor that's holding stuff down, causing this decline, all of that, and what should people be watching for? Maybe the Fed to pivot or or something like that in order to you know start a change or start a new uptrend. Okay. So you had Rob, Bob Furman on, who was a friend of mine. We play a little golf together, have lunch together. Who, who's better at golf, by the way? I can't tell you that. <laughs> Classified info. I'll tell you this. He's a good bit older than me and he can hammer the ball off the tee. Like that. You know what? I want to talk about Bob and what a trader. I'm going to diverge. Yeah. He is so Zen. He is like a temple. He eats healthy. He meditates. He takes care of himself way better than most people, better than me. And I, I, I do a good job, but not uh, so it, for his, it, as his age, he's much more mature than me. Stills ripped. Like so we played golf together it was over 90 degrees. It was like 97. It's like, we're going. Um, so I think his mental state, his mental game, is so good. And he's not trying to get, he, he's more in the stay rich business. So he doesn't act greedy, doesn't build up positions too big, doesn't panic, panic out. His mental game is on, is, you know, focused for sure. Um, so what was the question you had? Oh, the three. Okay. So yeah. the, I listened to your podcast with him. It was, it was so good. Um, but he brought up the matrix oil drives rates drives the dollar. Now, what's really happening today is funny. I think the rates are getting hammered and the dollar's up. Okay. So there's a little bit of a trend break or a, a correlation break. So that oil, Bob is completely, oil comp, uh, is the largest component of the CRB. If oil goes up and it's oil's breaking today, it's down, it's broken pretty good, which is fantastic for equities. But uh, the, the, the dominant fundamental factor is that matrix, which is mm -hmm. broken in the last couple of days. But the 10 years, really, the kryptonite. You know, we've had a horrible bond bear market, which has been kryptonite for equities. Now, again, we don't need... Now, there's intermediate and long rates and short rates. The Fed's been holding tight on short rates. But I think there's a chance that the bond market is getting very worried about the overall load of debt. And the intermediate rates are 
I don't know why they're going up, okay? The yield curve is flattening more or it's getting flatter. And that could be because of a concern about the level of debt. I don't know, but I will tell you this. We don't need rates to the Fed to cut rates. If the Fed just went on pause, earnings growth would start to matter again. We would not have valuation compression. And then you have a, a you know earnings growth. The, the, the market's already priced a stock on valuation where it should be at this minute. So if rates stop going up, then earnings growth is going to matter again and we can get stocks to trend. So there's a, another super long answer for you. But Bob, I was stunned because he never told me he watches that. And I've been talking about that every week for like six months. I was like, yeah, I've got it right. Well, at least we think, he and I think we have it right, but we might be wrong. Yeah, for sure. No, that's that's great. And Bob, Bob, that was fantastic to, to, to chat with him. Um, getting One back of your to- best ever. Oh, thank you. I, it's all because of him, all because of him, Not nothing on me. Um, get, getting back to the current conditions, you mentioned, you know, a flush. Uh, we were ch- chatting a little bit beforehand. Uh, as as this bear market is getting more mature and, you know, statistically, uh, you know, is it going to get close to the longest ever, whatever? Is it close to the end? W- what do you think needs to happen for it to finally end? Do we need to have that kind of final flush to to reset everything, create more bases? What, what do you think? What will be the sign to look for? Yes. Okay. The typical sign would be the put to call mm-hmm. in the VIX, but they are just not functioning properly. I mean, I don't know whether because it's single stock options or, or daily options or I don't know what is going on, but they tend not to respond to volatility right now. So normally I'd look for the VIX and the put to call, but I, I can't depend on that. Um, it appears to me that most people who are going to have sold because they were afraid have gotten out. Mm-hmm. So maybe they will, maybe we'll just kind of a bottom, we'll skip along the bottom for instead of flushing. I want the flush because that's like a demarcation. This is it. Everyone's really vomited up. I don't know if we'll get it. If we got it, I'd be very, very happy. But again, the market doesn't really love me, especially right now. I got no love. Market's giving me no love. Um, the answer is, where are you out or scare you out? I already said, I think the people who are afraid have been scared out. I think now it's like the lifers like me, mm-hmm. you know, that I'm, I've been doing this for 30 plus years, I think, I'm not giving up now. <laughs> but again, I say that because I know history. I know what's coming. Okay. Um, outside of the, you know, I, I will tell you, it's a quick story. IBD used to have the new highs, new lows in straight columns going down the paper. And I would, you know, every day I'd cut them out and pin them in my bulletin board. And also we got into a bear market many years ago and the, the list is getting longer, 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 longer. And I, it would, I mean, it was going all the way down almost to the floor. And I see 1500 new lows. And I, this is on NASDAQ alone, I think. And I jump up out of my bullpen because I was with the rookies and I go, the market's going to crash. Well, that was the dead bottom. It was extreme. And I think that is still functioning. Mm-hmm. And I think that we have seen an excessive number of new lows. And I will tell you, based from John Boyk, is dead right. No bull market ever starts without new highs. For certainly new lows dry up. Now, if the bear market's severe, the new highs will not show up immediately because they're so far off the high. You'll right. get a few. But... What's been so telling all year long is pretty much we had a little burst of net new highs that was obscure, de minimis. And lately, new lows have been drowning new highs. Uh, the Look, the new highs versus new lows, the IWC, the IWM, tell me we never got out of a, a, a bear market. We're still, I believe we're in a bear, remain in a bear. Um, Maybe we're maybe the question you asked will be answered by we're going to get a maybe a a breath spike down in net new lows. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm you don't have to know if we start skipping along the bottom, we have a follow through day, and all of a sudden we see like uh, deckers came ripping out. They'll usually one or two will come out before the follow through day, maybe three, and then all of a sudden the floodgates will open, the new leaders will emerge violently follow through days 
are not a green light to just charge. I've recently, in the last, whatever, couple of years, started to rate the follow-through day. Not all follow-through days are created equal. When you have wild power up, 3% single day up, on a 30% index volume increase, accompanied by multiple violent breakouts of high quality names, that's an A plus follow through day. Right. The last two we had, I'm right. screaming all day. I'm like, what am I gonna buy? Where's the volume? Where's the, and I can't find it. Now, when I have that, I know Bill would force me to buy something because he would probably, you know, I would either talk to him very shortly thereafter and he'd be like, what'd you buy? And if I didn't buy something, even if it was a C rated or a D rated follow through day, he would be cranky. He would flash um, disappointed. In me. And I don't ever want to disappoint the master. So that those are that's a 20 minute answer to your like one sentence question. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. And uh, you mentioned a lot IWC and IWM, which I, I think most people are mostly looking at the S&P 500 and, and the NASDAQ 100. Uh, do you think people should pay more attention to the small and mid cap uh, indexes to get more of a sense of that breadth and, and participation? I really think uh, micro cap. No, that's IWC, but yeah. IWM. Yes. IWM is, is that's the market. Okay. Um, yes. If you're not looking at that, look, if you, you had the mag seven and a couple others like SMCI and VRT and a few other very crowded trades. Elf, everybody listening to this probably is can slim or pseudo can slim was crowded into those little names. And that's why they broke so badly. Mm -hmm. um, SMCI had a really bad break before it really got going because it was like one or two or three names that everybody listening to this was all, if you were in, you were crowded in there. Yeah. So yes, the answer is you, you really need the Russell 2000 to exceed the price of 2000 is a long way to go before we really get i think you could call it a confirmed bull market if we had breath improve radically and it's going to take time to go all the way up to 2000 on the, or, uh, on the russell so the simple answer yes they definitely need to be paying attention to those perfect i think iwc was the first one to have a um a, a, a bear trap Mm -hmm. it, it was at a what I thought was a really nice base. It actually was the top, and it had one last gap up, and that broke first. And you know what broke before that? Crypto, yep. which is already bottomed. Crypto's leading by a wide margin. We've been in a bull market in crypto for a very long time, a, a year. Perfect. Yeah, I, and I definitely want to take a look at some crypto charts and, and take a look at that. Uh, but but first, you mentioned you know getting ready and this is the time where people should really be engaging and building lists what are you kind of doing personally as a part of your routine so you're staying on top of any emerging leadership at, and and basically knows them so you know what know what to look for dude i'm doing exactly what you do every single day every single weekend um i'm screening i'm looking for leading strength i screen for up ud up to down volume i screen mm -hmm. for relative strength is my number one mm -hmm. and then i run screens for Earnings beats, leading RS, you know, earnings estimates into the future. What's the, I have a 2020 screen, 20% 20 on pre-tax, after-tax, return on equity, sales growth, earnings growth, earnings beat. Um, basically, every variable that I look at, 20% or higher. Mm -hmm. You get a name like that, I mean, and a follow-through day, you could, any, oh, and it's got to be liquid. It's got to trade 100 million. 200 million average daily dollar volume. You're just, that's the magic elixir. Mm -hmm. It's sky high vol liquidity with really good earnings growth. Now to have that kind of liquidity, it's extremely rare that a mid cap is going to do it unless it's anointed an immediate darling. It's usually a, a, a lower mega cap. So you have to think like an institution. There are only so many places they can go that have the liquidity. So they're basically in a scramble for the most highest earnings growth they can get with the liquidity that will allow them in. You know they're all going to end up in that in those two, three, four names. Microsoft is in there right now. Um, Tesla used to be there. Um, so anyway, that's the magic elixir. 
and I'm screening, I'm doing exactly what I always do. Discipline and consistency. You can't turn away. Market speculation is not, oh, I'll be involved when it's sunny out. Okay. You're going to be late. You're going to miss it. And that's why mo there's a million reasons why most people fail, but most of them are, they're out like chasing beanie babies. You know, they're like, oh, I heard this, this new chain called Kenny Rogers Roasters. I think I'll open a couple of those right now. Um, this is a lifetime pursuit. You want to be, you want to get really, really rich, compound out at 15% plus a year for 50 years. I don't care whether you start with a million bucks, a hundred thousand or 10,000. Assuming you don't pay too much in taxes, you're going to have more money than you reasonably need. Now you might think you need a billion, but would a hundred million be okay? You know, that, that's, that's 50 years of hard work. Yeah. How I, I already said, I've been doing this for thir for 40 years. And I just ticked off like seven major bear markets I've been through. You know, I didn't give up. Giving up, discouraged, greedy, impulsive, ego, fear, selling before your stops are hit, oversized positions. I mean, the market is a non-human psychologist. It will expose your faults and weaknesses and it will hone you. It will make you hone your skills and know yourself or you're never going to make it. If you're a hothead or emotionally erratic, the market's no place for you. If you're immature, if you have to prove to the world because you were bullied that you've killed the world, you are never going to make it in the stock market. So um, now you could overcome all those. Any of the, I was many of those things. Mm -hmm. I overtraded, terribly overtraded. First of all, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> In 85, when I started, I had no clue. But as I started to learn, I started to learn psychology is really important. And that made me do a lot of ridiculous things. You know, how many people are going to go over all their trades at the end of the year? And if you have too many trades to go over, you're definitely over trading. <laughs> For sure. No, perfect. And so you mentioned a lot of screen criteria there. Um, I want to focus in on gap ups because like speaking with you a, a few times you know this this is something that's really important for you it's a great judge of risk appetite as well as a lot of the you know next true market leaders often start from gap ups or that can start the trend um do you specifically focus in on those or kind of any breakout will do pretty much no not not any break almost no breakouts will do yep. there's always something to buy there's always something breaking out but it might be coming out of a erratic base. It might lack all the variables I'm looking for. It might just rip out. And that's a swing trade. You can go buy your thousand lot and take two points out of it. And you could probably make a handsome living out of doing that. Um, but gapping out. Okay. So I was just asked recently, what is the safest base to buy? In other words, the highest probability that it's going to succeed. And I would say the cup and handle just following a bear market, which you know, if we, this bear market has caused a ton of, of left sides down. And then this recent three month or whatever recent Dow down move, we got three legs down has created a lot of double bottoms. Mm -hmm. They are safer and more probable to work. The gap out on earnings is more likely to fail, but when they work, there's those explosions occur because there's new information that no one understood. There's a revolution that's occurred with that company. Um, a simple example is when uh, the digital cameras were invented, they didn't come with memory. They would hold like two pictures. And I had a, um, my second or first, I can't remember. I think my doesn't I had a child, my wife. Uh, so I come in the office. I run my screen up on volume. So it's the first screen every morning. And up is SanDisk. And I think the volume was like, it was thousands of percent higher than normal. And I'd known the company because it was a flash memory maker from, you know, whatever, a long time ago. And I just, it just explodes out. It's up like 15 or 20% on the day and it's running wild. And I just, I just started buying the crap out of this thing. And it, every hour it was higher. And I just kept adding and all day. And my wife calls around lunch and she's like, I go, what are you doing? She's like, I'm out, you know, buying a, a, a memory stick. She goes, you know that camera we were gifted? She's like, uh, it only holds three pictures, but I have this new thing called a memory stick from SanDisk. 
and it's going to hold a hundred pictures. I'm like, oh my God, click, buy. <laughs> and then I bought it because nobody was expect that earnings beat was so ferocious. I'm going to overstate the case, but they were estimating like 15 cents and they earned like 65. Well, memory sticks were not going to be a major innovation or a, for three months or one quarter. Everybody who was going to go from film to digital was going to have to buy one of these things. And that was going to take time. Mm -hmm. And off SanDisk went. It just went wild. So gap ups are, you know, the essence of a true market leader is four to eight quarters of beat and raise earnings. If you can sit through that in a bull market, I mean, you, you know, they report 13, uh, they, they're expected to earn 13 cents, they report 60. They do, and the stock's got to ratchet up the valuation, analysts have got it up estimate. So it's beat and raise quarters and up goes the stock because of the new information. I have done of say the eight stocks that I've really made my net worth, like the, the killings I've made, that, that's how they, most of them occurred. I got a couple off of flat bases and a couple out of cup and handles, but the big ones, NVIDIA, I bought NVIDIA you know, a, a million years ago on like the first major explosion up. And I think I've told the story a thousand times, but I was buying hundred, I was buying big stuff. I, I bought like 150,000 shares or more. And Eve calls me up. She's like, Hey, moron, they're reporting earnings tonight. And I just said, I I'm going to risk it because they're, the volume was so ferocious. And sure enough, it was the first beaten race quarter and off that thing went and it went on a string of you know, this was a, this was, it might've been 10 years ago. I can't remember, but they, they, they all, look, they all do it. That outside of biotechnology, which might go on clinical trials or the launch of the drug, they're eventually going to have to earn money and beat and raise. Mm -hmm. That's the whole game. I mean, to me, uh, e-research came out in 2000, about a week before the follow through date, but it had everything on the table right there. It just... The institutions couldn't wait for it. That's the basketball underwater. It's it just got to go. So, <laughs> And is there a particular point in a stock's kind of life cycle that you focus on these gap ups? Because, uh, you know, often a stock comes public. It, there's a lot of hype, you know, around it. There's this basing period that Eve and, and those folks studied a lot. But then off the bottom, it could be driven by the first time that they have a profitable quarter or something like that. I think PLTR, the recent gap all, all, way off the bottom was caused by that. Uh, Spotify might've just had their first profitable quarter. Um, th is something like that something that you're really focused on is that, that first profitable quarter after a stock has come public? I end up in some of the biggest winning stocks in history that were IPOs in the last year or two, not because I was looking for IPOs in the last year or two. I was just screening for excellence. Yep. And they happen to meet that criteria when, you know, but Eve is dead right. They coined this phrase, the due diligence phase. So it comes public institutions have no clue and they take a year or two to, to get familiar with it, to assuming the thing doesn't just blow up and go down. Most IPOs are crap. They're mostly junk, but the ones that have buoyancy, they focus on and they send their analysts out there and, you know, whatever. And they report that takes nine months, a year, two years, sometimes, sometimes more, or maybe the company has got to evolve and come become more mature. And, but you don't have to screen for IPOs, just screen for excellence. And you'll, I, I caught Google, I caught Baidu was a recent two or three year IPO that I had a big move in. The, the criteria is the same, whether it's one week public or it's been public for 30 years and it's reinvented itself. Um, in general, I dislike IPO strongly. I think it's 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 kind of the the junk heap. Mm -hmm. They're so rare, the, the monsters, the needle in a haystack. Of course, everything I'm looking for is the needle in the haystack. Right. No, no. Oh, that's good. Um, let's see here. In terms of market leaders, because uh, some people, this might be the first podcast that they've ever watched of you, and have you mentioned TML way before, and and they might have been confused, but that means true market leader, folks. Um, I know you've done uh, a bunch of studies about them. Could you further kind of define what you're looking for 
and the, the characteristics that they exhibit both on a technical basis and also on the fun, fundamental side of things. You've already alluded to a lot of it, but I think it'd be good to concisely uh, explain that for people. Well, there's there's two variables. Oh, there's there's a lot of variables, but there's two categories. There's technical and there's fundamental. Mm -hmm. I believe that Mongo MDB, M MDB has the fundamental variables, okay? The product, sales growth, earnings growth, all the things I mentioned before, but it's not acting like a leader. If you find a leader before the market anoints it a leader, you're wasting time and likely to get stopped out and lose money. You, it's It must have relative strength. It must have institutional accumulation. The institutions that are buying your shares or hold your shares really, really matter. So it has to have a lot more than just the technical, the, the fundamental variables and the fundamental story. The market has got to believe that your brainchild is truly a brainchild, or maybe it's not even a brainchild, but the institutions think it is, okay? Whatever you think is great or TML quality is not TML quality unless it's anointed. In other words, it's under accumulation and uh, under accumulation by major funds with major size because Jim Rope buys a stock. I can take a whole position in 30 minutes. I mean, well, in a lot of stocks, most big stocks, okay? But when you are running 20 billion and then there's three other funds in your complex that are five or 10 billion each, those guys are going to be buying that thing for three or six months. Right. And they're not buying those enormous positions to hold for 20 minutes. Okay. They're and and institutions are super relevant because they're there to buy stock. When the market goes bad, like we're right now, and somebody wants to unload with three million, you know, a million shares, Fidelity will say, Well, we really like that stock. We'll take 500000 right now. You know, they're they're there, they've got open arms. If you don't have a quality institution with deep pockets underneath, who's going to buy those shares? And that's where you get these flushes, these violent breaks, and then they don't recover. So it, TMLs, I, I just think all the criteria I gave you with beaten raise, beaten raise, earnings surprise. This is another Bob Furman thing. I've been studying this for every, outside of biotech, well, Eric Cole proved that like 30% or 40% of the best stocks every year have no earnings. But I'm telling you, Bill O'Neill insisted on it and he insisted on it for a reason. That's why the comp rating is so darn important. Um, look, I, I have this simple thing. If it's good enough for Bill, it's good enough for me. What would Bill do? Bill was not buying junk with no earnings. You know, you want to look at the a lot of the best, they are insisting on earnings. And I'll tell you another thing. When the market goes bad, the first things that go illiquid and go and get blown up are no earnings, no sales. Those are just ideas that are public. And how, how important is it to uh, correspond to an overarching disruptive theme? You, you mentioned AI, which is kind of the key thing right now. Um, that's I assume that that's something you're certainly looking at as well. I, I just think, again, it has not broadened out. Alex Karp and Palantir, the market has called his bluff completely. You know, I, I was all in on Alex Karp. And I, I believe, that, uh, first of all, he's a great American. He understands the free market. Um, and I think he has a great product, but he oversold it. And the market called his bluff and they smashed the stock. He, he, needs, be, he needs beaten raise. And he is not. And his earnings growth and sales growth are not elite. They're, they're okay and good. But it, it's not like a lot of the other things we're looking at. Perfect. And um, I want to definitely run through some ideas with you. I know you've got some some stocks to look at. Uh, do you want to bring up uh, some charts and uh, we'll run through those? Uh, there's definitely a lot to talk about there. All right. Um, so for all you guys who want to know, you can look up right here. This is what's rocking on volume today. These are the best volume increases for the day. And it look, the market is not healthy. When you have lattice semiconductor down 20%, we had two or three semiconductors yesterday that were down 20% each. Um, but ANET is acting really, really well. Let's just start with ANET. Okay, this is an earnings powerhouse. 
beaten raise. Now, if we have a follow through day and this is acting like this today, if we have a follow through day tomorrow, which is possible, and this is already acting like this, this is a go to liquid leader. I'm going to blow this out and let's just, we'll go through the variables. So, can I don't know if you can see? I'm going to anoint because my tracking mouse. Yeah, I, I can see your cursor. Can you see it on the far right? Um, you see it now? Yeah, I see. I see it on the chart. All of that. Okay. Number one, first thing I go to earnings estimates: thirty-six percent growth. The average stock in the S and P is growing at like five percent. So this is rocking. It's liquid. It's traded seven point two million. Now that's high volume. Average daily volume is two million shares a day. Estimates for the coming year are up. The green triangle signal analysts have been revising higher. Pre-tax margins, 41.6%. Return on equity, uh, 32%. Last quarter, they beat. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I got to get rid of this. No worries. Okay, I'm trying to move this box. You can't see. Okay, so last quarter, lower left, they beat by 15.8%. Sales growth, 28%. Beat the earnings for the quarter were up 46%. But just look at these numbers. I mean, they've been growing steadily. This has a market cap of 61 billion. It's at the very, very, very low end of big cap. Okay, mm -hmm. it's at the way upper end of mid cap. It's past mid cap. Um, after tax margins, 36%. It, institutions are all over this. Ah, uh, don't I? I said that before I looked. I might be proving them uh, wrong. So you can see my internet is Wanda is just so slow, and this computer's old. <laughs> it might be twenty minutes before it shows up. We'll just see if there's any institutions in there. It is really running slow. I'm sorry about this. No worries. No worries. But it, look, it has all the variables. This is a major um, benefit. Okay, there's Fidelity's in there. Uh, two Fidelity funds. And then the one Fidelity fund just started a position that is mm -hmm. so valuable because you can rest assured, you can feel confident they're going to continue to build that. But AI is pre the products that Arista makes is important for the build out of AI. So this is a real beneficiary of it. And by the way, these guys who were in here are very likely to come back when they get more confident in the general market. So I'm going to close that, close this. Let's just, so I set alerts all day long and let's see what's going on here. This just broke back above the 50 day. So we're getting alerts here. Uh, whoa, this was a TML absolutely great fundamental story estimates 174 percent. this is celsius they signed a deal with pepsico for a much broader distribution i don't know why this stock is not doing well all i do is see more consumption of it but again i call the 50-day moving average in red here the guardrail below the guardrail is a no-go zone and as of this minute five of the seven Five of the mag seven are below the 50. A couple are big time below and a couple are, the ones that are above it are above it by that much. And there's a couple that are below it by a little bit, but like we're in a precarious, th this isn't further evidence that we're in a bear market. Now the, the, the mag seven are kind of trying to roll over. So I'm not sure what's happening. Um, you want to look at Decker's really quick? Yeah, let's do it. And Celsius, that, that dropped the 50 day. That was steep. Those two cell bars. The angle yeah. of deceleration on a clock face, anything that's decelerating quicker than 2, 230 on a clock face is no bueno. And that that is in itself a partial cell signal. Um, D-E-C-K, Deckers. It helps to have a little shopper running around your house. You're a little young. I don't know if you, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have children. Well, for no other reason, to for market research, have a couple. <laughs> um, okay, so this company, uh, they last quarter, lower left, they beat by 54% yes, uh, two days ago. The stock explodes out. 
earnings were 79% better than, than prior quarter or four quarters back, 25% sales growth, after-tax margins, 16.4%. I mean, it's 99 comp rating. It's It, it has everything. It has the red up triangles for uh, revised higher estimates. Um, this looks very, very good. And look, everybody's talking about O N O N, but this stock's it has TML variables and story. Market does not agree. That makes it a no go zone. It is off the radar. But it's not only is it below the fifty, it gapped below the fifty. Um, an institution owns twenty five percent of the shares. It's not enough. The greatest variables in the world are nothing. If you're like, by the way, this was a clue right here. So I put an arrow there because it was a big clue. This recovery was interesting. Um, I am I probably bought some right here. I, I know I've been in this stock, but I got out immediately right here. And that's that's it. That's all. She, it, it didn't even really rally back up to the 50. Now the 50 is pointing down. And this is a problem with the general market. Okay. All, all the MAs, I'm sorry, the 50 and the the 50 and the 21 are in bearish alignment here. Okay, they're rolling over. That is not healthy. And we're sitting just above the 200. I mean, the 200 day is not even a last resort. What are the MAs doing on the on the broadest market index in the in the market? They're, they're, all three are bearish alignment and steeply bearish. And I know I'm tangentially rolling all over the place. But right here in February, March of 21 is when the AD line peaked. This was a bear trap, immediately broke, had a leg down. We've been going sideways. We've tried to break out. I was very excited right here and again right here, but down we go. Now we've undercut these levels. This is definitively bear market for the whole decline. And this is even worse. I mean, this thing's just a train wreck. This did not make the higher high here. This definitively peaked right here. And we're wildly below, uh, the, let's call it 100. These indexes are sold out, in my opinion. I, I, I mean, could they go lower? Certainly. But the, the, primarily, the damage has been done here. Um, the big damage left, if there's, if, if there's going to be, I mean, a lot of people say, hey, the blue chips rise first, and maybe that's maybe the bull started. It just is. It's so thin and hasn't broadened out yet. And I love the cup and handle here. I mean, it's hard to ignore. Um, can we? You want to talk about Nvidia real quick? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so this is pretty disturbing to me. Um, Mike Webster did a study, and this black line is the twenty-one week. You get below that, he calls it the. Um, the Grateful Dead, that it's dead, is what he says. Well, it contained the whole move, and now we're living below it on a daily. I I, I have to acknowledge, a lot of people called this a double, to, um, head and shoulders top. Living below the 50 and the 21, 400 is the neckline. We broke it today, and back above it we went. So far, that is, and the volume is picking up. With 29 minutes to trade, this looks okay today. And it really matters because it's the most important stock in the whole world, bar none. I mean, the future of the world today, like electricity was the future of the world at one point, is AI. And AI doesn't work without, without NVIDIA. Advanced Micro may catch up and they may be a player or a big player, but right now they're more like BlackBerry came out and BlackBerry owned the, 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 the smartphone market. And then Apple came along later and beat them. But right now, NVIDIA is the man to beat. And this is very much so a giant cup and handle. In my Ropal report last weekend, I said, it's getting ragged. The handle is getting very ragged. And I, I, I don't know exactly what the difference is between these two, but this is definitively ragged. I mean, below the 200 day no no good so there's limited opportunity here for the market to prove itself anything lower in these key leaders like 
if Nvidia starts living below 400, that's that's a major major problem. Um, now you could get like they say the the last man standing when the most important stock in the whole market flushes. That might be the end. So again, I won't bet it until we see a follow through day and more leaders come out and start to act really well. I mean, META looks very good. It's just the market is too oppressive. It's like the the wave, the ride the wave is caught the surfer and it, 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 he's in the washing machine. Um, it's hard to be, I mean, like ANET is very important to watch because is it gonna roll over? Because Microsoft beat, they had a beautiful quarter. And it gapped up, it closed okay in the range, and then the next day it gave every bit of it back. We'll see what, even the names that are beating are struggling, okay? So we need to see very, at least that's got to stop. Um, how about... You mentioned PDD and a few of those. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, there's, a, there's something happening with China. Now, this has been it's a very scary, bad day, yeah. but it held the 50-day. But it gave up everything from its breakout right here. It's round tripped. I mean, this is a picture perfect. I don't exactly love this jagged up the right side, but it's still pretty good. Volume, it was actually being accumulated through this handle in here. It gaps out and breaks out against a very negative tape. This looks really, really good. And the variables are there, although institutions are not, mm -hmm. but they beat by 42%. Guys, this is critical, and I didn't discuss it yet, is up to down volume. 1.0 is neutral. 2.3 is like driving a Vega or a go-kart at 200 miles an hour, okay? You got your AMC pacer whipping down the highway at 200. That's what this is. It's it's That's ferocious accumulation. Estimates are great. Pre-tax return on equity, quarterlies, after-tax margins. This just has everything. It's a 98 comp. Shocker. Um, ED. The Ch this is a Chinese name, by the way. Again, look, the, you've got 99 comp stock being circled by the pinwheel here. 64% estimates. Now, if these numbers are, are they're improving. They're not quite there yet, but they're good. 1.6 up to down volume, management owns 12%. It's a turnaround, 41% uh, earnings beat. Now I don't like this overhead. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hate, loathe, and detest entirely, said the Grinch, overhead supply. It's just, but this is acting really good. Another Chinese name, M-N-S-O, Menso has stores. Look at, I mean, guys, look at this. Just because it came public two years ago, that's irrelevant to me, okay? It meets all the criteria. Well, before I say it, oh, 98 comp rating. Estimates, great. 20% pre-tax return on equity. This is a retailer. Retailers historically run on very, very thin margins. These numbers are gargantuan for a retailer. Ramping sales, it's, it's, they're not just earnings growth is not just going up they're accelerating largely sales growth clearly accelerating they only beat by 13 percent, but they're kind of precluded by new stores they can open uh 1.2 up to down volume in a brutal tape i mean this thing looks and now this relative strength line was leading the stock out that's why i put the arrow there and um let's see here N T E S. That's N E T S actually. No, here we go. 95 comp rating. I'm just, I, mean, I don't have to go through all the numbers. It's all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And what's really great about this is somebody who is brilliant, Kyle Bass, Mr. Uber influential, is you know screaming from the rooftops. They're a communist state. They're going to attack Taiwan. They're stealing your intellectual property they're very they're not just bad actors they're they're homicidal narcissistic they're crazy they're they're these are bad bad actors he's killed it's a cult of personality that he anybody who disagrees with him he's murdered him 
So the, he's not even getting the news. He, his, company's, his country's breaking down because he can't make decisions. He doesn't have the staff to run a country of 1.3 billion people. And he's right about all this stuff, but the stocks are going up. So what matters? Price. Is Xi stimulating the economy? Is the, and, and at the same time, they have the worst debt to GDP. And they're, 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 their debt is so crazy off the rails, it's not even funny. But price is going up for now. So I'm following the price. Um, I like when there's a very negative story, but the price is going up. It means there's something going on that's not quite understood or only certain people understand it. And the price is reflecting truth yep. at, the, at the moment. Yep. Kyle Bass is right. <laughs> it's just the rubber hasn't met the road with that yet, just yet. So um, I, I have to show you one last thing. I call this the Mona Lisa Mac Daddy of bases. I don't think gold in 2011 knew it was going to form the biggest cup and handle in a, it's an elegant cup and handle. It's not jagged. And look at, this is on the, look at the monthly volume bar here as it's trying to come up as the 10 year and longer dated treasuries are struggling. I, I don't know what this is saying, but it's saying something that pattern didn't just develop for no reason. Um, I have to show you a G I, I think this is probably your strongest name in the, in the category. This is just a very, very, very big broad base. Um, G F I is gold. This is South African. I don't know if you can tolerate that, but again, this thing's been going sideways forever. Um, a lot, while we're doing this, one of my favorite Indian companies. Look at that. This is booking.com price line for India. Mm -hmm. Looks like the Indians are about to uh, get in those planes and go somewhere else and go on vacation. So I, I can't ignore something like this. It just looks too good. So I, you know, um, Louise Yamada coined the phrase, the bigger the base, the higher in space. And these are just gigantic bases. I just want to do a little history. Mm -hmm. So up here on the far left, Three Arrows Capital blows up. Terra Luna blows up. I mean, these are frauds. They're 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 problems, mishandled at very best. It would they were mishandled. Then you have the fraud of the century when FTX imploded. That would be like literally. It would be like Nasdaq and New York Stock Exchange at the exact same time closing. That that's how grave how 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 much volume they did. Okay, then Silvergate gets shut down. Then we have the closure of Signature Bank, which was government driven. They didn't even need to close that bank. The government just suffocated them. Now look how after FTX, it just gets super tight, 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 explodes up. Volume comes in sideways. Then we have another down move because of Silvergate. Then the market, by the way, look at this uptrend line. These are death blow after death blow. Then this SEC comes out and sues Coinbase and Binance. And Binance might be fraudulent, I don't know, but the market doesn't care. And now, in my opinion, I, I, I don't wanna call this just yet, but I think we're looking at a high tide flag, okay? This comes out of there, look out. Now I, I, I am fully aware if when I go way back like, I'm trying to, my computer won't, there's a lot of overhead is what I would like to show you. And it's going to take me a second. You're not going to allow me to come back on if I don't get a, a new computer. I have like five laptops. So I just happen to have the one that's the worst. Um, the, the overhead here on the left is, is, is omnipresent. You, you can't ignore that. And I, I loathe, hate and detest entirely overhead, but I've been through this. I've been through three major bears with crypto. I, in my crypto fund, I've gone from euphoria intoxicated to death blow i've seen this so it it can chew through this very quickly the liquidity in the system in the crypto market is dried up the long-term holders the amount of coins hold by whales is all-time high hash rate all-time high the halvening you want to explain the halvening really quick yeah for sure 
blocks on the blockchain have to be validated, proven to be correct. And they are they are mining. Mining validates the block by solving a cryptographic equation. And then the, once that's validated, the block goes on the blockchain and the people who run all the computers or mining rigs to solve the cryptographic equation for their efforts and power and costs, they get rewarded in Bitcoin. And right now it's nine Bitcoin per block. It is going to fall to four and a half Bitcoin around mid-April, I think the 24th, which is going to reduce the supply coming on the market by half. Because mining is very capital intensive and they've got, they have to sell coins to pay their bills. And when you remove half the supply, when there's no liquidity in the market, and we're about to get a Bitcoin ETF very likely, Larry Fink calls um, Bitcoin a flight to safety. Think about the people who are raising money here. There, Fidelity's involved. Um, Ken Griffin's involved. Citadel's involved. I mean, the monster players, ARC is involved. People who understand the future are building out here. You've got institutional adoption is really coming on. I know this because I know people who are selling to the institutions. They're getting the incoming calls. This is setting up to be a culmination of like all the stars aligning where massive demand is coming into no supply in an illiquid market. Bitcoin has a violent personality, violently down and violently up. I believe we've started the next cycle for those reasons. And I mean, the technicalities of Bitcoin are more intricate than the technicalities of the stock market. It, 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 when my co-founder, Matt D'Souza, who unfortunately passed away, brought this to me, it took me years. Okay, so I... I'm not going to give you guys a, diff, a, a like intricate technical definition or breakdown of what's going on with Bitcoin. Just look at the chart. That's all you need. And like, uh, look at Chainlink right now. I believe ICP is, it's currently the 28th largest market cap of all coins, has massive intrinsic value. The amount of uh, people building out on that uh, platform is ramping. Uh, I really like Bitcoin a lot. Again, be careful. I am drinking the Kool-Aid and a significant percentage of my net worth is wrapped up in it. So my objectivity is has some foggy glasses on. <laughs> and can you touch a little bit about uh, the Ethereum Bitcoin relationship that that you mentioned and, and why, you know, why that discrepancy is and, and maybe some themes behind that? Well, Bitcoin has value in that it can transfer value, it's store value. It's kind of like digital gold. But it's, I call it a one trick pony. It's a stupid coin. It has no ability to do anything else. Now there's some platforms they're trying to build on it that might enable it to do other things. But Ethereum has what they call a smart contract, which allows you to program it to settle a bet. There's, there's 20,000 uses for the smart contract. It, it is, its utility is so much greater than Bitcoin. Now, a lot of people are going to laugh at me, but when that is realized, I think it could it could exceed the value of Bitcoin. It could that's called the flippening. It, this is such a broad topic. I'll just leave it at this. Bitcoin is a one trick pony, and Ethereum is like the unlimited possibility use case. It has it can do everything. It can. Pretty much anything you want to do, which involves two parties, it can do. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's radically more valuable and it, it actually has better performance than Bitcoin. But today, to give you an example of how early and infantile this rally is, the blue chip seal of approval coin is leading. We're so far away from a speculative, um, you know, irrationally exuberant market. We're, we're, we're at base layer here. We're at stop one. All right, this is like, you know, it's like Microsoft moving up. It, you know, like when you get like no earnings.com biotech jam together coming, that the market's over. Yep. That, that's the altcoins. We're in its infancy of this rally. And um, it's leading the stock market. I talked about this a while back. I'm like, crypto is bottomed. It's going to lead the market. And people kind of laughed at me. How you like me now? <laughs> 
And uh, bringing it back to the stocks, and, and I've just got some a few wrap up questions, Jim. Um, FOMC coming up. What's kind of your mindset going into that? Uh, what 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 thoughts are going through your head? If this, then that. How are you preparing for for different scenarios with what they say as well as the market reactions? Look, every single day, I've got my war. I've got my war list. I've got my my battle plan right here. Don't ever forget the golden goose. Um, we are deeply oversold on so many variables. We could very, very easily have a follow through day tomorrow. I don't know what the FOMC is going to do. It's more important actually what they say. Today is day three, tomorrow's day four. Follow through days between day four and day 10 are the most powerful. I'm ready for anything. If Nvidia breaks, I'm ready for a flush. If the Fed says, for some reason, they have some mystery indicator that says inflation's over and they are going to ease, the market is going to take off like a shot, I'm, I'm ready to go both ways. I can do anything. But I'm going to do it in a tempered fashion predicated on how the leaders emerge, how I grade the quality of the follow-through day. I am not an on or off switch. I am a rheostat. I turn a little bit look at the results of what I did, turn it a little more, turn it a little more, turn it back. I mean, generally I'm building positions. I don't just walk in and buy 100,000 shares of XYZ. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll buy 50, I'll buy 20, I'll buy, I'll buy, it depends on the temperature of the market. I might buy 1,000 shares or I might buy 150,000. Like if the market is red hot and we're in a rational exuberance period, I've got big cushion. I'm coming in 10% position, and I'm going to blast that thing up to 15, 18% before it's up one and a half percent. But in a bear market, I might buy a hundred shares. I, I, it, how much cushion do you have? How were the leaders acting? How was the quality of the last follow through day? All this, all these things factor into the matrix. What am I going to do tomorrow? Probably not much. If I, if we had a great, here, I govern myself with guardrails, the 50-day moving average, but I don't allow myself or anybody working for me to adjust the equity of their account by more than 30% in a day, up or down. It keeps you from being too fearful or too greedy. Now, in 2000 or early 21, uh, 2021 or in 2001, I had like 13 stocks that Climax ran in a very, in like in a, in a day. And I, I went like 50%. I, I, and there are special occasions. Like your child wants to sleep over at their friends on a weeknight. Well, that's once a year or once every three years. Rules are rules. Rules are not meant to be broken, except in those rare occurrences. They're, they're pliable, but if you make special occasions every 20 minutes, you have no rules. You've lost your discipline. So I don't I don't let myself move that rheostat more than 30% up or down on my equity. So no matter what happens tomorrow, you know, I could buy three stocks, 10% a piece on a wildly, wildly bullish, exceptionally A plus follow through day. And if we have a crummy follow through day, I might buy one stock. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are you going to do tomorrow? Probably, probably not much. I, I'm in the same boat. Uh, but, but again, it's a mindset shift. I got it. You got to think positive and, and keep building that list. So you're ready when, when that breath really does expand. How about this? If we're really starting a new bull market, my history studies show that the shortest bull market was like nine months. Well, I don't have to commit 150% long on day one. I can build in and more likely this has not been a garden variety bear. This has been a violent bear. Look at ARC, the av look at look at IWM, look at Peloton, Zoom. Growth has not is there's been a, a big smoke screen here. All right. What you're seeing in the indexes is not underlying what's happened to growth. This is a this is a wildly severe bear market. The rubber band has been, if you have a rubber band, you pull it out like this, the recovers like that. When you pull it way out. We're going to, I suspect we are going to have a major bull market because the duration has been long. 
the magnitude of growth has been very, very severe. And the recovery is going to be, I think, equally as good. Even if we are in a secular bear, we're going to have a, 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 a snapback recovery. The Fed is not going to raise rates in perpetuity. They're going to, at some point, they're going to win. Um, and the innovation never stopped. So I think we are setting up for one heck of a monster rally, but it's not today. You got to take those bull horns and pull them down. Yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, Jim, just one last question. Uh, what general advice do you have for traders, you know, watching this during this time and and maybe take it from the perspective of what, what would Bill recommend to people if, if he was doing a presentation right now? What, what would he say at the end of it uh, to, to inspire everybody and and make sure that they're ready for for when that new uptrend, new new bull market really comes around. I think Bill, I don't know if Bill ever said this, but I feel he would say this. It's what I would say for sure. You don't have to run like I did and take crazy cowboy risks to get really rich. Just maybe you could make it a lot easier on yourself and go a little slower. Don't trade quite so big and compound for 50 years you can still get, you, I don't know how much money you think you need, but you can make more money than anybody ever would need in 20, 30 years with not a lot to start, as long as you don't draw down too much because you take too big risks. So just be patient, follow the trend. Trend following is real, it works. Can slim, absolutely works. Markets follow earnings and interest rates. If you earn, if a company earns a dollar today and they're gonna earn $14 in three years, Assuming we're not in a horrible bear market, that stock's going higher. So just chill and be patient. It will come to you. If you try to force it, you're going to lose money and you're going to get discouraged and leave. As far as like being optimistic, there is nowhere in the world like the United States. There never has been. We are gentrifying the world. We're doing our best to help everyone in the world and raise the standards of everyone the quickest way to kill a dictator or a, a, a communist is by giving everybody in your country a job or purpose in life. And that's what the golden goose is doing. These people who are inventing, inventors don't care about interest rates. I mean, they might care because they might not get as much funding, but they are out there innovating. Every, everybody wants a piece of the American dream. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. And everybody who invents something that has value is going to, it's, it's going to be a product that's going to make people's lives better. We're on a massive upward trend. We The world's never seen this much innovation occur all at once. Kathy Wood has had bad performance because she has terrible risk management, but she's right about the fundamentals. She is dead right. So don't get discouraged. The sun is going to come up tomorrow. I've sat through much worse bear markets a couple of times. This is going to end and there's a fortune to be made. I said in the rest of my life, eight more bull markets, 50, 60, 80, 100 great opportunities in each one of them. How do you stop that? How do you stop human innovation? How do you stop someone's desire to achieve? In, in, unless the golden goose of capitalism is suffocated by socialism, you, you're not going to stop that. And I don't see that happening anytime soon, no matter who crazy, how crazy these people are running for office. So that's all I have there. Awesome, Jim. It's really always a pleasure talking with you. Uh, I get re-inspired and, and uh, always learn something new as well. So, uh, Jim, where can people learn more from you? Uh, I know you just founded the Rope Report. Where, where can people reach you and, and check out more of, of uh, your education? All right. This is the Rope Report. I started writing this like 30 years ago and I disbanded it because I just, I was, I talk about the great evolution of society. I had to go to the print shop, print 1500 of these fold them by hand, stuff them in an envelope and mail them to people. Now I do it every Sunday night and I just digitally send it to you by the internet. And I cover every market, every sector, the dominant fundamental factor, my best buy ideas, everything that matters for Can Slim. And then every Wednesday, I do a podcast where I answer all your questions. I will sit there and answer questions for an hour plus. Every single person who emails me, you know, NVIDIA broke the neckline today. What should you do? What should I do? I answer all your questions and again, give you my best ideas. There's a, a both, there's the Sunday night research report and then the Wednesday webinar. 
you can bundle them together and save like 30 plus percent. Um, and I'll give it to your subscribers only, maybe the IBD people too. If you put in founder, you get like another 30% off, which brings it down like, you don't know, way off what you're supposed to pay for it. So um, go to ropelreport.com or just ropelreport.com, sign up for the bundle, and I will do my very, very best to keep you on track through bull and bear markets and give you all my best ideas. And thank you, Richard, so much for having me. I love doing your show. I think you get the absolute best out of your guests, man. You interview, you and Arusha, you're the, you're the guys who I think you get the really good things out of people. And I love coming on. So anytime you want to have me on, buddy, I'm your man. Yeah, well, it, it's always it's always great having you on. Yeah, Arusha's great. I just sit here. I don't know. I, I just let you talk. But uh, you don't sit there. You're the Johnny Carson, bud. You're no. you're there writing down the notes. I'm gonna get the follow up question just right. That's people know. Believe me, people tell me that Mowgli, he's the best. Well, well, thank you very much. And and Jim, always always great having you on. Uh, I hope everybody watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Uh, make sure to please leave a like down below on the video. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Jim, would you mind telling them to subscribe to the channel and, and why they should? Because all the all the people you want to listen to where he's interviewing them. There you and go. There you go. And you free information, which can change your life. I mean, you know, that's what I love about the stock market. Whether you're a paper boy or a doctor, anybody can buy the 50 shares. I started trading in 85 with like, one lot of options, two lots of options, 50, 100 shares at a time. It, I was, you don't want to know my backstory. Okay. I was least likely to succeed times 50. And if I can do it, starting trading one lots of options and 50 lots of stock and go to where I now run three hedge funds and have the Ropal report and people even care what I have to say, if I can do this, anybody, the free market is free access to everyone to level up your life. And Richard is interviewing all these people like Furman who are telling you exactly how to do it. I mean, you know, like it's not lack of education, it's lack of effort. Everything you need to know is in reminiscences of a stock operator. It's in how to make money in stocks. Richard's having these guests on, it's lack of effort. It's la laziness, it's discipline, it's no, no emotional control. There is no excuse. If I could start with hundreds of dollars, literally, and go to where I've gone, I mean, my hedge fund made 30 million in one trade, and I came from one lot. If I can do that, anybody listening can do that. So that's why you should listen to Richard. <laughs> there you go. Well, this is the longest outro I've ever done. So, so thank you for that, Jim. Uh, thank you again to everybody watching. Hopefully you enjoyed, and we'll see you guys in future videos. Take care. Mm -hmm.